the long run, there can be no joy for anybody until there is joy finally for us all. When large numbers of people share their joy in common, the happiness of each is greater because each adds fuel to the other's flame. Joy is prayer. Joy is strength. Joy is love. Joy is a net of love that draws people in. Joy is the simplest form of gratitude. The best way to show our gratitude to God and the people is to accept everything with joy. A joyful heart is the inevitable result of a heart burning with love. Never let anything so fill you with sorrow as to make you forget the joy of the Christ risen. Well, good morning again. It's so good to see all of you here this morning. Thank you. And again, thank you for joining us uh, by live stream. And thank you for doing that in person this morning. I appreciate you giving us Sunday morning uh, to share together. My senior year in high school was going fantastic until my high school sweetheart of three years dumped me. I was devastated. I limped my way across my little town of Sinton, Texas to knock on the door of the church parsonage where our pastor lived to pour my heart out to him, forgetting that he's a retired Marine drill sergeant. I did not say former Marine drill sergeant. There are no former Marines. He was a retired Marine. And I poured my heart out to him, and as you can imagine, his words were less than warm and comforting. They were along the lines of something like, suck it up, buttercup. But then he said something I didn't agree with at the time, but now do. He said, Joe, get a hold of yourself. There's going to be a day in the future at some point when you will rejoice, be glad, and thank God that she has dumped you. Turns out, he was right. I think even she would agree for sure. There's this truth, things turn out, and it's quite the biblical truth, and we're going to look at it this morning. Take your copy of God's Word and look with me in Paul's letter to the Philippians, or open up the church app and go to the scripture text there. In Philippians chapter 1, we are introduced to the idea of Paul being in a prison cell and yet writing about joy. We begin to talk about this last Sunday and uh, we talked about the difference between happiness and joy, happiness being circumstantial and situational, and joy being this underlying foundational current or river ready to explode with this deep sense of joy in God. Paul says in chapter 1, verse 12, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that my circumstances have turned out. For the greater progress of the gospel. Did you catch the phrase? Paul says, my circumstances have turned out. This morning, I want you to hear that message. I, I don't want you to hear the message from my retired Marine drill sergeant pastor, suck it up, buttercup. But I do want you to hear this message. Circumstances turn out. Out. Now, I want to focus on that word circumstances, the word that Paul uses. Maybe in your text, your version, uh, it might say something like, my imprisonment for the sake of the gospel has turned out, or my situation of being in jail because of preaching the gospel has worked out. But Paul actually uses a word that the translators of the New American Standard Version that I read most common and did this morning have translated the word circumstances. He uses one singular word. I want you to get this morning. And the word is this. 
as in this. This, this situation, this circumstance, this, this mess, I find my, this, Paul says, has turned out. I want to ask you this question. What is your this? Now, maybe you're not in a circumstance right now. You're not in a situation that you would call kind of a this moment right now. But there may be a day in the next week or two or next month where you wish you'd paid a whole lot more close attention to the message this morning. Hey, well, what was that thing that Pastor was talking about? Paul was talking about something turns out. Pay attention. Maybe you've been in a situation or circumstance in the past. You've had a this and it's been years, perhaps decades. You're still waiting for it to turn out. Maybe you're in the midst of a circumstance right now that, that is so dark, it is so challenging that you can't even really imagine there ever being a way for it to turn out. I want to encourage you this morning. The scriptures say, turns out. Circumstances turn out. Let's keep reading. Let's dig a little further. Verses 12 through 14, Paul repeats, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else, and that most of the brothers and sisters, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Now, the reason Paul is in jail is because he won't shut up about Jesus, and the authorities are tired of listening to it, and the Jewish leaders are very concerned about this story about the resurrected Christ that Paul is telling and exclaiming to people, and to shut him up, they put him in jail. But it has the opposite effect on the situation. Rather than squelching the message, it actually gives rise to the message being spread farther and among other people. For one thing, Paul is preaching the gospel to his guards and to fellow prisoners. And throughout the entire jail, guys are coming to faith in this resurrected Christ that Paul is talking about. And even town folk are coming by the jail to get a glimpse of this strange, radical follower who tells the tale of a resurrected Savior. And as they come by to get a glimpse, they are hearing him preach through the jail cell bars, and they are coming to faith as well, so that those who come to faith are being encouraged and motivated that if he can be arrested for it, surely I can talk plainly in the streets, and more and more and more people are coming to Christ and believing in the resurrected Savior. So rather than squelching, it is spreading the gospel. My circumstances, Paul says, turns out are a better thing for the kingdom, for its message. Now, sometimes when we are waiting for circumstances to turn out or in the midst of those circumstances, we experience things that are totally different than what we expect them to look like. Paul talks about that right here. Let's keep reading in verses 15 through 17. He says, some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some also from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than from pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. What then? I love it. Paul says literally, so what? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in this, I rejoice. Paul is telling us that oftentimes in our situations and our circumstances that things turn out or at least look like they're going to turn out in ways that we do not expect, even ways that we would not have drawn it up, ways that we would not have designed it. How many of you like me have kind of looked to heaven and said, hey God, you know, if, <laughs> if you're asking me how I would do this is I would do it this way. We've all done that before or lied that we haven't one way or the other. And how many times have we done that? And Paul is saying sometimes they don't turn out quite like we think we're going to. It's very similar kind of idea when Paul says to the Romans a little bit later in his history, on his way to stand before Caesar and have his day in court, on his way eventually to his execution, 
he writes and is still sticking to the same story years later in his letter to the Romans where he says, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Circumstances turn out. Now you may be thinking this morning, well, that all sounds good, preacher, but here's the deal. Things are very, very difficult right now in our culture, in our society, and quite frankly, I, I don't like the circumstances, and I don't see how they're going to turn out, and I'm worried about how they're going to turn out. What if they don't turn out like we need for them to? Or what if they don't turn out at all? Well, I know things are very difficult. And there is a response right now in our culture that is becoming more and more prevalent. And I want you to lean in and hear this. You and I, as the people of God who believe in the scriptures that teach that circumstances turn out, need to have a different response than what our culture and our society is having in this situation and in this circumstance. Right now, our culture is responding in a very disastrous way. For years, our culture has been known as a throwaway culture in that it's easier and more convenient, though not necessarily less expensive, but easier and more convenient than when something breaks down or fails in its function that rather than repair it, we just trash it and replace it with a new one, the throwaway culture. But we have taken that to a whole new level now in our cultural experience and we have moved from being a throwaway culture to a culture that is known for quitting. We are quitting employment. We are quitting commitments. We are quitting relationships. Quite frankly, what we are bailing on is not products, but people. We are quitting on people. Right now in our culture, in our society, with everything that's going on, it is so tempting for us to withdraw and withhold. And that is the opposite of what we as the people of God ought to be doing. We need to step up and make sure that we don't quit. Now this quitting thing is across every socioeconomic level, it's across every demographic, it's across every vocation and career in our culture, even among those who have the highest calling of caring for people and being role models, the ministers and the pastors. I share with you this statistic that was just published by Barna Group and Church Pulse. 29% of pastors have given serious consideration to quitting the full-time ministry in the last 12 months. Notice what it says. It doesn't say that pastors and ministers are thinking about quitting their current situation of ministry and moving to where the grass is greener. What it's saying is, is that 29%, almost one-third of pastors are giving serious consideration in the last 12 months to calling it quits to ministry altogether. Washing their hands, I'm done, see ya, bye. That is a very serious misunderstanding of what our call is as the people of God. We are called to respond as if it's true that circumstances turn out. It's what Paul did. If you look at the end of this very first chapter, you, you see that Paul has this wrestling match going on within him. Whether it is, it is better to just give in and let them execute him and die for the preaching of the gospel or to stick around as long as he possibly can to keep preaching. He says, to me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. He's got this wrestling match going on. But then he says, I will remain. I will not let myself be executed. I will do everything I can to stay alive and keep preaching the gospel. And the reason is, is because of the joy of his understanding that the circumstances have turned out. I want you to come in close. In 2012, I fell in love with this church. I was your interim pastor. Some of you know that. Some of you didn't know that. Some of you don't care. But in 2012, I was your interim pastor for a year. And I fell in love with you as a church family. 
I was itinerant, traveling all the time, preaching somewhere else all the different time. Even while I was preaching with you on Sundays, I was preaching other places during the week. I was traveling all over the place doing my itinerant ministry. God had called me to the road kind of ministry, and I was doing that. And I remember as I left and your new pastor was coming in, I remember praying specifically, God, if you ever call me off of the road and back into the pastorate, I sure hope that you call me to a church like First Baptist Church Temple. It turns out that in 2017, that is exactly what God did. Not just a church like First Temple, but First Temple itself. And I have to tell you, as tough as the last 12 to 15 months have been, I would not consider anything other than the joy it has been to spend the last months with you, I will not quit, and I'm asking you to not quit either. It is not the place of God's people to quit. The reason is, is because circumstances turn out. Look in verses 18 through 20. So what? Paul says, only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed. And in this I rejoice. And yes, I will continue to rejoice. For I know that this will turn out. There's that phrase again. For my deliverance through your prayers and the provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope, that I will not be put to shame in anything, but that with all boldness, Christ will, even now, as always, be lifted up in my body, whether by living or by being put to death. He can say all of that because of the joy that comes in his life. Because he knows circumstances. His this turns out. I want you to think about your this for a moment. It may be painful for you to think about. Maybe you wanted to come today and kind of get your mind off of it. But I want to ask you to actually focus on your this, your circumstance, your situation. Your this. I want you to focus on it. As you do so, I want you to consider Joseph in the Old Testament. Old Testament Joseph who was sold into slavery by his brothers. And then the ones who bought him traded him to somebody else. And eventually he became a subject to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. He found himself in prison, in jail. But it turns out 14 years later, when God's people, including all of his brothers and his father, were in the midst of a famine, they came to Egypt seeking food, seeking supply. And guess who, after 14 years, it turns out, had been put in charge of all the grain supply in the kingdom of Egypt. Guess who? Joseph tells us this in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. Joseph said to his brothers, this Get that? This, it's exactly the word he uses. This that you meant for evil turns out God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result. As you consider your this, I bring to your attention New Testament Joseph. Engaged to Mary. When Joseph discovered that his supposed virgin bride-to-be was pregnant. His this became a potential disaster and he was going to walk away. And though he didn't want to embarrass her publicly, was going to divorce her privately. But Matthew chapter 1 verse 20 says this. But when Joseph had thought this over... Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife for this. That's the word, the same word that Paul used 
in Philippians chapter 1, verse 12, to talk about his circumstances, the this. The angel says to Joseph, for this which has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. This turns out, now Joseph in the Old Testament had to wait 14 years for it to happen. Joseph in the New Testament had to wait for 33 years before it would be verified and validated that this which was supposedly conceived of the Holy Spirit truly was when Christ was crucified and buried and rose from the grave. But we don't know from the text whether Joseph was even around or even still alive on the earth 33 years later. But, turns out, this that had been conceived in his bride-to-be's womb was indeed the Holy Son of God. As you consider your this, I have time for one more. The night was before he was to be crucified, Jesus was in the garden praying. And this is what Matthew chapter 26, verse 39 and 40 tell us. Jesus praying in the garden of Gethsemane. He went a little beyond them, the disciples, and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My Father, if it is possible, let, guess what? This cup pass from me. Not as I will, but as you will. Beloved, this turns out better. Circumstances turn out. Let us rejoice. Let us rejoice. Let's pray. Would you silently and faithfully right now, whether you're in this room or watching by live stream, would you take your this, your circumstances, and give them to the Lord and say, Lord, I can't wait to see how they're going to turn out. It might take weeks, months, years, decades. It might be after my lifetime, but I trust you, God, because circumstances turn out. I will rejoice. Lord, hear our prayers. Let us rejoice. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen.